So let's start with the um, network coding and we have different terms here. The first is called interflow network coding and as there's also an analog version we call it digital interflow network coding. Right? These are the basics and we will introduce it also how historically it came um, to, the, to, the, uh, to us, to the, um, to the researchers. And the first example what is there with network coding is always the butterfly. And in the butterfly it's a given topology. You have on the top one communication node which is the source and down here two receivers. Right? And other intermediate nodes, uh, they are connected via one link and each of the links can carry one packet, so to speak. Now you see here you have on the left, the source will send out two packets, A and B, and both destinations would like to get both packets. So how is this possible? So you see along the left wing here you can have packet A, on the right wing you have packet B, so far so good. And in the middle you see something happens, two packets arrive at the intermediate node. Two inputs, only one output. And there you make a routing decision. So classical networks today, this is um, store and forward, you have to make a decision A or B. You can say maybe the other packet comes later, but now you have to make a decision and then you say A goes first. And if you send A and then on this kind you multicast it to both sides, then the right destination will be happy because it got A from the direct um, wing and then you have um, A from the intermediate nodes. On the other side you have received twice A. Also received two packets but you have only one information which is A. So it's not we, you don't make this side happy, right? Um, if, even if you make a different routing decision here with packet B it's the same only that now destination on the left is happy and not on the right. Question is, is there a better solution than that? And of course there is, there are network codings come into the picture. Something at this intermediate node will happen. So when packet A and B arrive here, instead of sending A or B, why not sending a linear function of both of them? What is the linear function? It could be a mixture of the colors. Imagine you have packet A and B and this is yellow and blue. If you just mix it, it becomes green. Right? So now you have a green packet and this green packet you are um, multicasting and when you arrive in a yellow one on the left and you get a green one, you ask yourself what made this packet green if I, if I added yellow into that? Of course a blue one. And the other one would get a blue one directly, get a green one and deriving from the green and the blue that it got directly, he will even come up with the solution of A. So something happens here in the combination. This is interesting, right? We now argued over colors. But there's of course a mathematical way of doing that and operating on bits. There was a work by Alswede, um, Raymond Young and others 2000 and they came up with this example. The main work here was not about the, the network coding itself, maybe they coined the term network coding, that's for sure. They came also up with a capacity calculation, I will show you this later. But the idea of using some mixing of packets was there before especially in storage, but for communication not so much. But what is really the difference between this old way, store and forward, and something that you do? Later we call this compute and forward. You maybe remember the Kirchhoff's law, right? We are all electrical engineers. You understand whatever goes into a node will also be the output of the node. That is true for electricity, that is true for traffic, for water pipes, for oil pipes, whatever kind of pipes it is. It's called the uh, node connectivity law, so whatever goes in goes out. With network coding, there's something different. There will be some information going in, but we find a function to describe the two inputs. And the nice thing for us engineers was always, when it comes to packet information or current, we could borrow the principle of others. Now, if we start with network coding, we are alone. It's a very important note because most people think about network coding as something as black magic or whatsoever because they think they're, they're doing something different. Yes, we do something different and there's a good reason for it because it's more practical, it's very easy for engineering purposes. So we are breaking with this classical engineering way and go somewhere else. Now if you look in, into another theory of communication networks, it's called the max flow min cut theory. What does it mean? If you have here a certain network and you want to understand um, what is the max flow over a min cut, you can take your topology and cut wherever you want it. And there are cuts here of um, weight 2, 3 and 4, so the min cut is 2. 
And if you do that on the other side, it's also true. So what it tells you is the capacity, the maximum capacity you can achieve here is two. But if you remember, we only had two on the one side and one on the other. So it's one and a half. So network coding tells you later, you can always achieve the min cut max flow um, capacity. Before we do that, let me just tell you how we did the coding, right? There will be an exercise. If you see this um, lady on the, on the right here, this means exercise. And um, there will be some uh, code examples for that. Now I show you ex ex uh, actually how we do the mixing of the colors, which is not colors, it's really bits. If you think about packet A as a bit sequence of 0, 1, 0, 1, but that could be of any length, right? And the same on the B side, you will just send the bit stream um, to the nodes as we did before. You pass it on, forwarding it on the, on the sides. And what happens here on the, where we normally mix the colors, now what you do is you take the two inputs and you just do a simple XOR. Some people also call it XOR network coding or whatsoever. That this is only a, a simple example. Um, you can do it even later with more advanced functions, but XOR is the most simple one that you can find. So you take the, the two inputs here as packets and by XORing, XORing means um, if you have the input 0, 0, as a result you get 0, 0. If you have 1 and 0, you get also 1 and so on. In general, if you have two different inputs, it becomes 1. If you have two equal inputs, it becomes 0. Okay? And this is what you do here. Two equal inputs, um, 0 and uh, two different 1, 1, 1. And then we, again, 1 and 1 to the same input it becomes 0. So this is now the mixed signal, the green packet. And you just forward this one here. And if you just pass it on to the others, there is not only a coding here, it is also a decoding on that side. What you do is you get the direct pass, the yellow one, this is the upper one, and then you get the green one, which is here, and you XOR it. And magically, on this side, XORing the two inputs will give you the missing packet, which is 0011, which is the blue one up here. And on the other side, it also works. So suddenly, the same topology, the same rules, the same protocols, but just by introducing some intermediate coding at this node and some decoding on the end nodes, gives you more capacity. So this is the toy example that everybody will come with. So, but there are some questions, right? First of all, how do you know what you have to do here? How do you not know that this is the green packet, and not a blue packet? Could be also that this was not, he was not coding, he, they just wanted to give you two packets. So in order to understand which kind of packets we have, we have to identify what we are doing. And therefore, we do a, a so-called encoding vector in front of the packets. So here you see, um, if it's packet one, we say we set the first bit to one. If it's the second, we set the second bit to one. If you have more, like let's say um, four packets you want to code together, and it's the fourth packet, it's zero, 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 one. So just indicating where it is. So this tells you first packet, this is the second one. And if you take the encoding vector and you come to the point when you do the coding the first time, you not only code the packets with the payload, you also code the encoding vector here. And suddenly there's a written a 1-1. One, one. What it means is this packet, the green one, is a representation of packet 1 and packet 2. It's a linear combination of both. When you then send it to one of the destinations and you do exactly the coding, decoding as before, by combining the two packets, something comes out, which means 0, 1, and then a payload. And this means this is the second packet. So what you did here is something different to the normal coding we know. Normally you have a code book. You know what the, coder, the encoder is doing and the decoder is doing, the inverse of that. But here the code book is in front of the packet. So now people might say, okay, this is an extra burden because we have to carry the the encoding vector over here, but is it really a burden? As you see with two packets, we have two bits extra. Go two bits um, and four bits payloads is 50%, but as I said, the packet itself could be also 1,500 byte, and the encoding vector would be still two. But this encoding vector can grow. It will grow with the decision of how many packets we put together and also how the mathematical operation will later work on a different field. So this might, um, get larger and larger. But therefore we have to discuss about this encoding vector. But interesting is that the codebook is generated on the fly, whatever we are doing. 
So mathematically, if you look at this, um, it's also quite interesting if you see the butterfly again and just argue over inputs, right? So you put um, inputs x1 and x2 uh, over here, the two information entities, and at the destination you would like to have y1 and y2. And the same output on y1 and y2 on the other side. So what did we actually do? We just forwarded x1 on the left wing and forwarded x2 on the right wing. And then the incoming streams x1 and x2 are, um, are given to this node. And now the node is coding these two packets together by having some coding coefficients, c1 and c2. And this means the, the plus here is an x or later on, right? So you have the coding decisions and you send this. So at the end, what you get is a linear equation system. So what is now y1 and y2? So y1 is directly x1 and y2 is the linear combination. And on the other side, y1 is the linear combination and y2 is x2 directly. If you do the matrix form here, we only, we are not, in, here's the input, this is the output, and now you see the, the coding matrix over here. And you have to make a decision for C1 and C2. Later we will discuss about the rank of the matrix and whether these things are linear dependent. So the question is now, C1 and C2 will tell you, should I code this packet or shouldn't I code it? If you think you should code it, the C value should get one. If you don't want to code it in, it should be zero. And this means if you look at this matrix, there are two options what you can put at C1 and C2 to make this rank two. So to make this really to get two, um, not the same, but different um, outputs for Y1 and Y2, which means C1 is one and C2 is one. That works. Or C1 is zero and C2, one is, uh, C2 is one. So two different options, right? But this is only the left part. If you go to the right part, if you make this uh, one zero, that works, or one one, even that works, right? But if you combine both, the only combination that works for both to get a rank on both sides that is equal to two is to make C1 and C2 equal to one. So before that, in the example, I just co coded them together. But was this a good idea? Apparently yes in the end, and even this tells you how to do this. And you know that if you go to, um, to um, Professor Joswig, where they will calculate these deterministic code sets, saying what is the code coefficient here and here for any kind of network. So once you understand what happens here, you understand that we are sending linear combinations. And if we go out to the companies to explain them network coding, we always make not this kind of explanation with linear equations. What we say is, look at this multi-hop network. It's a mesh network, not wireless, it's uh, wired. You have some uh, different um, information like a banana, an apple and a coconut and you um, enter here and you would like to come out in, in uh, Berlin. And if you, following the basic principle of the internet, you would just move everything along one path, which is not good for the security because if the hacker is sitting somewhere in Munich, he can read all of the information. Secure routing says, why don't we use multiple paths sending different information? So we obfuscate the information going over different passes. Now the attacker still understands there's ongoing transmission and gets only partial information, one third of the information in this example. And if you are a friend of Facebook, you always see the following example. What they're doing there is to ask the following thing. Yeah, what are two apples and a banana is 24 and so on. And then you have to solve the next equation and you, you see how, how your, all your friends are failing with linear algebra, right? And you lose the respect of them. So these are linear equations. And if you understand that, um, then you can even solve this and sending linear equation through the network. And suddenly for this guy it becomes very dangerous because he, he sees there's still communication ongoing, but he cannot see anymore what goes on. Because there's one information and two unknown. So one equation, one un two unknown is unsolvable more or less, if it is not a sparse source or whatsoever. But there is some inherent security in that. So the first discussion was about bandwidth and efficiency. Now we are talking about security, right? But this was only um, a side effect. 